Hi guys, um, I'm hoping, so the ecosystem stage already started, but you know, this is innovation stage, so this will be much better. Uh, I'm super excited to see a lot of young people who came to uh, listen to our first new speakers who are coming on stage. My name is Natalia, uh, I'll be your host today, uh, so I hope you don't get sick of me. Uh, but actually, the more important thing that is coming on is our first speaker. Finally, after yesterday where um, I only had men on stage, I get a beautiful lady coming on. Um, her name is <laughs> Lila Jonah. Come on stage. Come on, please join me. Uh, she's a CEO of Luxme, uh, which is uh, a beauty brand that launched two weeks ago, and she'll talk about it. And also the CEO and founder of Summersource. So welcome on stage. Thank Hi. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> Would you like to stand or sit down? You have a choice. I think we should sit. You want to sit given down? Given my oh, yeah, shoe situation. Heels, so yeah. that's a good idea. <laughs> So Lila, tell us something about yourself. Uh, what, what do your companies do? You are, you're a CEO of many companies. You've been involved around. Tell us what you actually do. Just two companies. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I run a nonprofit social enterprise called Sama Source. Sama means, uh, <laughs> thank you. I don't know if you guys can hear me okay. Okay, good. Uh, Sama means equal in Sanskrit, and we connect low-income people to work through the internet around the world. So our model is poverty reduction through job creation, and we harness the internet economy to do that. So we're now actually the largest data services company in East Africa. We employ wow. uh, about 1,100 workers wow. doing things like image tagging for self-driving cars and a lot of... Uh, like basic data work for some of the, the technologies coming out of Silicon Valley. So not only are you beautiful, but you actually are hel you are helping the economy, <laughs> which is awesome. That's very kind of uh, you. Can, can you all hear in the back? Can you hear us okay? Okay, good. So, uh, so what about um, your very famous uh, new beauty brand that launched two weeks ago? Do you want to sure. tell us about so that? So I don't know if it's very famous, but we have a, a new company that just started called Luxmi, LXMI.com. And uh, Lakshmi's name comes from the Hindu goddess of prosperity, Lakshmi, okay. beauty and prosperity. And the mission of the company is similar to Sama Source. We're taking the model of impact sourcing and fair trade and elevating it to the luxury consumer. So when you go to a duty-free st uh, store and you see beauty creams, most of the creams that you see on the counter are not made of organic or natural ingredients, and they don't really have any social impact. You're paying okay. maybe $200 uh, or euros for a very high-end product, but there's no social impact. The, the product is not making the world more beautiful. We think that every luxury product should have social and environmental wow. impact embedded in the way that it's made. It should in 2016 be normal for you to buy a product that does good things in the world. So Luxme is about rare and organic ingredients that are ethically sourced. Okay. We source these natural ingredients from women's cooperatives. We're starting in okay. Uganda where we have a presence awesome. with Sama Source. And, uh, and so we launched our first product which is called Creme du Nil. It's a, it's a face cream. And and it's sold now at 300 Sephora stores in the U.S. and awesome. uh, on QVC on home shopping. So <laughs> that deserves you. a clapping. <laughs> um, so Sephora stores. Um, I've heard a lot about the brand. Yes, I had to read about you, but as well uh, on the media coverage. Do you want to talk about where you know where people can find more about Luxme and yeah. where it has been talked about? Sure. We uh, we launched in in Vogue um, in the U.S. in the September issue, which is like the big issue for fashionistas. <laughs> and uh, if you had told me, thank you. If you told me like a year ago that we would have a beauty brand on the pages of Vogue that would talk about Uganda and sourcing these nuts from the Nile River Valley with low-income women. I mean, I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> so I think the world is changing so much. I mean, I, I think there's such a hunger among luxury consumers, and especially among women. Uh, women direct most of the purchasing in households. So there's such a desire to ensure that that money is spent on things that actually do good for the world. That's awesome. Um, I really love that product, and I cannot wait to go to <laughs> Sephora now. Um, so do you want to tell us a bit about your background and uh, how you came from um, you know, tech into um, beauty? industry? Sure. So it's kind of an odd transition to go from data services and Samosource to Luxme, but my passion is, is ad addressing poverty through work. I spent time working at the World Bank. I worked in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and I encountered extreme poverty firsthand, people living on less than $2 a day. In 2016, there is no excuse for more than a billion people living on less than a dollar a day. We can do better than that. 
I really think we can. And so one of the best ways to address poverty at the grassroots is, is quite obvious. It's, it's to create jobs for the lowest income people and ensure that they are directly employed. So I think there are so many industries in which this model could make a huge difference. If you look at the world of tech with Samosaurus, we realized that we could train people who come from informal uh, settlements like slums and rural areas. We could train people with, with very little computer or technology background to do these basic tasks. And I think similarly in industries like skincare and beauty, there's also that sort of opportunity. So our vision is to encourage more companies to do what we call impact sourcing, this idea of hiring people at the base of, of the pyramid to do real work and paying them living wages. And, and the transition from Samasource to Lexme was just kind of random. I was in northern Uganda doing work for Samasource and came across this amazing ingredient. It's actually a type of East African shea butter, and it's okay. called Nilotica. Oh. So I thought, this is, this is an amazing ingredient. Someone should export this. Someone should market this to luxury consumers. If people are willing to pay $200 for a skin cream that's made out of chemicals and synthetics, why won't they spend that same money on something Thing that's natural and organic How and good for you. How did you come across such an ingredient? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, when I travel, I don't, you know, I guess uh, I don't get to see that. Well, uh, I love going, I love shopping okay. wherever I go, <laughs> um, but I don't like shopping in malls. I love shopping in outdoor markets awesome. and meeting the artisans who make beautiful things. I mean, across the Middle East, you have some amazing artisanally produced jewelry and leather work and, and that sort of thing. So for me, the, the biggest pleasure when I travel to a new country is meeting the artisans from that country. So in, in Uganda, one of the things that women make locally is this shea butter, and that's how I got introduced to it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so. Your two companies are, one is getting successful, um, another one is already well known. Uh, how did you get into, how do you, get, how do you raise capital? How do you get the distribution for Laxmi? Um, and uh, where is this all coming from? So uh, how many of you are entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience? Just uh, by a show of hands. Okay, so almost everyone. <laughs> That's really <laughs> nice to see. So uh, fundraising is going to be uh, one of your biggest pain points, and uh, at some points it'll be like the bane of your existence. Um, it, for Samasource as a nonprofit, was incredibly difficult to raise money for the first two years. We were rejected from every major foundation in the world. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, all of these big guys said, you're completely crazy if you think that people from slums are going to be able to do technology work. Wow. And I, I thought they were wrong. Um, and over time, we showed them evidence that they were wrong. <laughs> and slowly, we started getting grants from these big foundations um, after showing them evidence that our model was working. Okay. And on the for-profit side, Luxme is a for-profit company. We're going through a B Corporation certification. So this is a new category of business in the United States that recognizes companies that have a social mission. It's like a fair trade label or like a doing good label for business. And so, uh, but still, we, we decided to, to raise the money um, as a venture-backed company and go out to angels and Silicon Valley investors. And we actually got Reid Hoffman and Tim Kugel, who's the founding CEO of Yahoo, to be our first investors in, in Luxme. And I would say that uh, the biggest driver for them was seeing something that was disruptive, something that was truly different, even though they're, they're two older guys uh, who don't really use beauty products. <laughs> um, no offense to them. But they thought this was a really interesting model, this idea of disrupting luxury beauty with a natural, organic story, and also a social impact component. Um, and then they, they, you know, they saw that we had a strong business plan and some really good leads at some of the big retailers. I guess my, my number one piece of advice for fundraising is to break down the, uh, the timeline into small chunks and think of the first phase as a pilot phase. So can you show proof of concept by bootstrapping your model without maybe quitting your job, using your salary to fund the first step of the work? And once you show that there's real evidence that your program is working, it becomes easier to get people to buy into it and, and fund it. So I hope you guys are taking notes. Um, <laughs> so you, you talked a bit about poverty and uh, what you've so seen around the world. Um, how do you think, could you actually, or is your company also uh, based in Lebanon, and how do you think we can uh, apply your business models into the Lebanese market? 
Sure. So, uh, so Sama Source is mostly active in East Africa. We have a presence in India and a presence in Haiti and the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a, a new model called advisory services. So we're going out around the world and consulting to local organizations on how they might use this model of impact sourcing to create employment locally. So we've we've spoken with the governments of Morocco and Malaysia. Um, we we are working on some plans in the Middle East okay. uh, to create employment for local youth and and consider working with the refugee population. So hopefully we'll be able to announce something uh, That's soon. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I asked a good question. Um, I have, so we have a lot of younger crowd here today. Uh, if you would be sitting in there, she's, I'm guessing you guys are, um, you know, getting into university. 16. 16. Uh, if wow. you would be sitting here and you would be 16, what would you tell yourself? You guys are very mature for 16 because I definitely was not going to tech conferences <laughs> <laughs> and planning out my future enterprise. So amazing that you're already here. Um, I think that the number one thing to remember, there's such an emphasis on youth uh, and on doing things now and on being the next Mark Zuckerberg and having an overnight success. Most of the overnight successes in Silicon Valley took 10 years to build at least. So just remember that. If you get discouraged in the early days, remember that anything worth doing is going to involve a lot of struggle and a lot of hardship. Personally, I think being an entrepreneur requires some kind of mental instability uh, because it, <laughs> it really is not very rational to quit a, a good paying job and uh, sleep on your friend's futon. I had to do that for several months and live <laughs> off of ramen noodles also. I love which ramen I had noodles. To do. You get sick of them after a while. So it's a, it can be a very difficult path and the people who make it in the long run are people who see that this is a marathon and not a sprint and people who who see the bigger picture there's a great saying that humans tend to overestimate what we can do in one year but underestimate what we can do in 10. so so <laughs> you think about it as a <laughs> very nice as a said. as kind of a long uh, a longer haul project with, with sama source i was so impatient and in the first two years i mean i literally there were so many moments when i wanted to quit no one was believing in us and it, it really took many years for the world to kind of accept this new model this idea that people from slums could do real work for real companies and so so i think if you're doing something truly innovative it's going to take a long time and you have to prepare yourself emotionally and mentally and and even physically for the journey <laughs> so you are talking about this amazing journey that I think now everyone wants to take in a way, mm -hmm. even though you said people have to be mentally unstable. Uh, what do you feel were the biggest challenges? Um, other than, you know, being a woman in this crazy environment, what, is, was that a challenge actually, to be a woman in this environment? Uh, you know, so we know that fewer than 8% of partners at venture capital firms are female. And we also know that even without overt discrimination, Pe people tend to fund people who are like them, right? There's a lot of data that shows that if you're a venture capitalist, you're more likely to fund an entrepreneur who resembles you. Maybe they went to the same college, maybe they play the same sport, you know, the, the person has to have some similarities. And so subconsciously, I think there's a lot of bias against people who are non-traditional entrepreneurs, whether that's women mm -hmm. or, you know, minorities, there are very few African-American uh, venture-backed or, or startups led by African-Americans that are venture-backed in the U.S. So I think that that if you are a minority approaching VCs for funding, the first thing you have to do is work on your own psychology to not be intimidated and present the, the facts as best you can. I think um, it's very hard to argue with data. So if you have strong data <laughs> that your model is working, even yeah. again at that pilot stage, it's, it becomes easier to fundraise. So one challenge uh, you know, is, is getting that capital. And, and for us, a bigger challenge was this idea of merging social impact with a real viable business model. Because on the one hand, we had all of these philanthropies, these big donors, who were not used to seeing business models. So they said, but you're partnering with Microsoft. That seems like a business. That's not a charity. We're not going to fund you. We, we fund charities. And we had to explain that if you really want to see a difference in, in people who are living in poverty, if you really want to see measurable outcomes, uh, you have to look at the data. The data is that giving them jobs is more effective than, than the traditional handout model that so many NGOs and charities employ. Um, and then on the flip 
side, we had we had company, you know, uh, funders who who looked at us as a business, and they said, "Well, what is this business about helping poor people? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this doesn't contribute to profit maximization." So, being in the middle um, and and trying to forge a third path for social entrepreneurship between traditional charity and traditional. Uh, profit maximizing business can be very challenging. But I also think, you know, there are companies like, how many of you have heard of Patagonia, the outdoor apparel company? Anyone here? It's uh, one of the most inspiring companies in the world. I highly recommend looking at their history. They were founded by an entrepreneur named Yvonne Chouinard, um, who wrote a book called Let My People Go Surfing, about his very unusual business philosophy. But they built an, an enormous outdoor apparel brand with sustainability and social impact woven into the brand from the very beginning. And I think that's the future. I think every company will have a social impact component in the future because millennials really want to see that. So I, unfortunately, I would love to chat with you for an <laughs> another hour. We have to, unfortunately, wrap up. Any last message you would like to give to the crowd today? Sure. Just remember that if you want to be an entrepreneur, it is a long run journey. Um, it's going to take time and a lot of perseverance. And in the words of uh, one of my favorite venture capitalists, Ben Horowitz, don't punk out and quit. <laughs> <laughs> and where's the cream? <laughs> <laughs> right. And the cream you can, um, you can look up at luxme.com, lxmi.com. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much, Lila. This was um, amazing. Thank you. <laughs>